the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Peter Kropotkin, Wellbeing for All, by Ruth Kinner. Peter Kropotkin is best known for his concept of mutual aid and for his advocacy of anarchist communism. In the first role, he is usually painted as a scientist, naturalist or ethicist, the anarchist who proved in the 1890s that nature was not, as social Darwinists claimed, red in tooth and claw, but ordered by instinctive and environmentally conditioned habits of cooperation. As an advocate, Kropotkin emerges as a political theorist and strategist, the leading player of a trio completed by Carlo Caffiero and Elise Reclou, who persuaded the anarchist 1880 Congress of the Jura Federation to declare communism as its revolutionary goal. The two aspects of Kropotkin's work are too rarely linked, yet they are equally integral to what Kropotkin called well-being for all. This concept albeit only roughly sketched in Kropotkin's writings, highlights both Kropotkin's holistic approach to economics and his belief in the transformative power of ideas. Both mutual aid and communism are now commonplace in anarchist thought, yet they were absorbed into political discourse with varying degrees of enthusiasm. Without sparking obvious controversy, mutual aid became a watchword for anarchist communists almost as soon as Kropotkin started discussing it in the 1880s, if not earlier. Communism gained traction in anarchist movements more slowly and provoked considerable debate. Neither concept had a clear or precise meaning. For example, Kropotkin described mutual aid as a neglected factor of evolution and used it both to describe an individual's capacity to cooperate and to classify types or levels of social systems. He used it to analyse the sociological forces that fostered or militated against mutual aid societies and to explore anti-authoritarian ethics without obligation, those that issued from cooperative self-organisation. Yet confusion about communism caused more difficulty for anarchists than the plasticity of mutual aid. Anarchists were averse to communism for two reasons. First, communism smacked of authoritarianism, This had deep roots dating back to the 1840s when Pierre-Joseph Proudhon had rejected communism as a monastic, authoritarian form of socialism, a doctrine of equality realised through dictatorship. In the aftermath of the French Revolution, communism evoked conspiratorialism, Jacobinism and terror. Second, communism was linked to the principle of distribution according to need and, therefore, to the realisation of a socio-economic programme that appeared to some to dilute anarchist libertarianism. This was how some Spanish anarchists understood the anarchist communist position. From their perspective, it was less a principled stance than it was a doctrinaire constraint. They called for anarchism without adjectives and the abandonment of all suffixes in order to signal their misgivings about the over-specification of revolutionary goals. Later in the century, the pro-feminist Voltaire de Clare took up their call, this time considering the political implications of rival individualist and communist positions. She argued that both types of economy were potentially threatening to the realisation of equal liberty. Proudhon's anti-communist thrust ran deep in the Jura Federation. In 1871, when the acrimonious debates between Michael Bakunin and Karl Marx came to a head in the First International, Bakunin's anti-authoritarian followers called themselves collectivist, not communist. For the Bakuninists, these were not just rival currents in socialism, they were incompatible. One pointed towards decentralised federation and locally determined actions, and the other to centralised organisation, the specification of a revolutionary programme and party organisation. Kropotkin and his allies argued that this was a misperception, While the differences between anti-authoritarians and authoritarians were real and unbridgeable, the labelling was misleading. 
Kropotkin's starting point was that socialists were committed to the same anti-capitalist principle, collective ownership. His worry was that Marxist socialists were effectively derailing the project by seeking to channel collectivisation through statist governmental systems. These socialists argued about strategy, whether to promote insurrectionary or reformist action, but envisaged collectivisation as the transfer of institutional power and the introduction of socialist planning. Soviet power plus electrification, as Lenin put it in the State and Revolution. Scientific socialists, those who subscribed to Marx's theory of history, also expected a transition phase, a period enabling planners to work out the details of their egalitarian schemas, specifically how to shift the economy from a work-based system to one capable of meeting needs. Either way, mass revolutionary action was merely the catalyst for social transformation. Revolutionary government was the proper vehicle for the transformation from capitalism to socialism. In anarchism, Kropotkin argued, Collectivisation would be accomplished independently of the existing political machinery by the de- direct expropriation of land and resources by the expropriated and the creation of new communal institutions. The point was to avoid revolutionary government and the reassertion of state control. According to anarchist precepts, the goal of revolutionaries was to facilitate the transformation of the political institutions that enabled ex- economic exploitation not to use the existing infrastructure to provide equality within the state. It made no sense to revolutionise economic relations while leaving political structures intact. In 1919, Kropotkin delivered the same message to Lenin, criticising his drive to flood revolutionary organisations with party workers in the name of political enlightenment as a destructive and autocratic move. Kropotkin's argument to the Jura Federation was strategic, For as long as anti-authoritarians called themselves collectivists, not communists, the distinctiveness of their conception of revolution was likely to be lost. In other words, collectivism was too easily confused with the Marxist or social democratic models of collectivisation. Although Marx had laid claim to communism when he wrote the Manifesto in 1848, Kropotkin believed that communism, rightly understood, evoked the decentralised, direct action of the 1871 Paris Commune. Twenty years after Mutual Aid was first published in book form, Kropotkin revisited the debates he had led in the Jura Federation with one of Bakunin's close comrades, James Guillaume. In 1902, he told Guillaume that in 1880, he believed that the association of socialism with the principle of collective ownership dangerously blurred the differences between anti-authoritarian and authoritarian collectivism, and that communism alone clearly signalled the determination of anarchists to collectivise through communalisation. Acknowledging that the name change had created tensions in the anarchist movement, he denied that his proposal had amounted to a shift in anarchist politics. As a communist, Kropotkin also subscribed to the principle of distribution according to needs, a position that put him at at odds with many anarchist individualists and proponents of anarchism without adjectives. But his rejection of individual reward was an argument about the best institutional defence of collectivism against the re-emergence of the monopoly, not about the principle of common ownership. In principle, he argued, the anarchist adoption of communism was entirely consistent with Proudhon's anti-communist critique and Bakunin's collectivist stance. Kropotkin argued that developments in European socialism, namely the emergence of Marxist social democracy in the 1880s and 90s, had confirmed the correctness of his view. In 1902, Kropotkin told Guillaume that he was more fearful than ever about the prospects for anarchist socialism and libertarian revolution. Workers were wrongly placing their trust in party hacks and backing the introduction of sweeping programmes of nationalisation. This was not communism even if its proponents advocated distribution according to need. The social democratic collectivist programme altered the basis of ownership, but reinforced the principle of ownership, increasing the state's monopolistic power to boot. Collectivism was distribution according to bureaucracy. Kropotkin called it state socialism, and reviving Bakunin's terminology, authoritarian. Continuing to call for the direct expropriation of land and resources, and the creation of new communal associations, 
Kropotkin outlined a fresh appeal for anarchist communism, now describing it comprehensively by elaborating a concept, well-being for all. Well-being for all was Kropotkin's catchphrase for the economy transformed. It meant the abandonment of the artificial restrictions on production which arose from price fixing, defunding the police, justice systems, prisons and arms industries, diverting resources from the production of luxury goods made to satisfy the depraved tastes of the fashionable mob and repossessing property. In essence, Kropotkin's idea was not to run the existing economic system under new management or to equalise benefits according to the rules that prevailed in capitalism, but to reshape the economy according to libertarian principles. Kropotkin summed up his vision of economic redevelopment as the study of the needs of humanity and of the economic means to satisfy them. It replaced political economy, or the science of waste of energy, under the system of wagedom. The redevelopment of the intellectual field involved two conceptual changes. First, the measures of well-being and assessments of human flourishing would be formulated locally by community groups and associations. Kropotkin would have rejected utterly the imposition of universal barometers like gross domestic product. Second, social relations would be structured by free agreement. Libertarian economics naturally entailed a reflection on what and how to produce, but it consciously injected economics with a new moral purpose. Whereas political economy was moralised through profit and growth, money-making and exploitation, libertarian economics was shaped by sharing, giving, generosity and creative expression. It dispensed with the abstract analysis of labour, value, supply and demand, production and consumption, and proceeded instead with concepts of desire and estimations of possibility. Framing well-being as a right, Kropotkin described it as a right to possess the wealth of the community and the fruit of the labour of past and present generations. He continued. And while asserting their right to live in comfort, they assert what is still more important their right to decide for themselves what this comfort shall be, what must be produced to ensure it, and what discarded as no longer of value. The right to well-being means the possibility of living like human beings and of bringing up children to be members of a society better than ours. Kropotkin's second proposal for free agreement was the social principle that underpinned libertarian economics. It replaced contract the bedrock of social relations in capitalism. Contract represented the parties to agreements abstractly as equal individuals and treated their arrangements as fair because they were deemed to be concluded freely. Thus employment contracts assumed that workers consented to employers' terms and employment law was elaborated to determine how disputes between them were to be enforced. This concept of agreement had its origins in the idea of property and the principle of exchange and Kropotkin argued that it, it had become the model for all social relationships in capitalism, even our most intimate. In marriage, as in labour, terms are enforced by law and usually with little regard for actual equality. Women took marriage vows as junior partners, dominated by husbands, subject to their discipline and reliant on their goodwill. In contrast, free agreement was non-individualist, because it was materialised through the recognition of common inheritance and shared purpose, and it was anti-authoritarian because it depended on trust. There was no external authority to enforce a free agreement, nor were there any central governance of the organisations and institutions that free agreement stimulated. Kropotkin imagined that these would be infinitely varied and the result of the continual growth of the needs of civilised man, replacing government interference. The reference to civilised man perhaps highlighted the limits to Kropotkin's reimagination of economics. He was also wedded to ideas of development through the exploitation of natural resources and land clearance that sit uncomfortably with contemporary ecological perspectives. Yet his two principles, local community judgment of well-being and free agreement, provided a framework for an adjustable and flexible concept of anarchist libertarian communism which is still relevant today. Kropotkin argued that well-being for all was not a dream, but a genuine possibility. This was a revealing position, which in fact indicated his recognition of the utopian quality of the ideal he sketched. 
What made it real? Kropotkin's answer was mutual aid. Understanding the human capacity to cooperate, seeing how historic and existing communities had created environments that enabled cooperation and minimised the individual struggle for competitive advantage, and finally, viewing sociability at Wellspring for an ethics of care and compassion were the three essential components of well-being. The theory of mutual aid explained all of them. Kropotkin's theory decoupled biological fitness from individual competition, analysed the development of sociability in tribal societies, village communities, European medieval city-states, everyday voluntary associations, and correlated this sociology to an ethics of non-reciprocal giving. For Kropotkin, mutual aid was rooted in science, but it was not Marx's scientific socialism. Instead of demonstrating how capitalism would be transformed, it highlighted what was necessary to make the transformation of capitalism possible. Revolutions, Kropotkin argued, were built on confidence and conviction. The ideals and aspirations that animated direct action were critical to revolutionary success. The triumph of the French bourgeoisie over the sans-culottes in 1793 and the Bolshevik coup of 1917 demonstrated the truth of that proposition. In the 1914 preface to Mutual Aid, he noted that only the first part of his thesis, the idea that mutual aid represented in evolution an important and progressive element, had gained ground within the scientific community in the 12 years since the book's publication. The second sociological element of his thesis was still not generally accepted. The leaders of contemporary thought, he noted, continued to maintain that the masses had little concern in the evolution of sociable institutions of man and that all the progress made in this direction was due to the intellectual, political and military leaders of the inert mass. Anarchist communism was always ripe for the taking, but to move from conventional notions of leadership and planning, a leap of faith was required to spur the destruction of capitalism and the realisation of well-being for all. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.